a vocabulary um, is important. Uh, secondly, what we mean when we uh, th say, when we talk about knowing a word, what is a word and, and how indeed do we know it? Um, we'll talk about coverage and comprehen comprehension. Uh, we'll talk about how many words we might need for exams, GCSE and A-level, but also uh, need in order to be fluent or, or communicative or competent in a language. And we might look then at how we can improve vocabulary uptake. Thank you uh, for the 30 or so of you who did the pre-webinar questionnaire. You will see the results from that in the session as we go through it. So without further ado, I shall hand over to uh, Jim. Righto. Okay. That's, um, if we move on to the next slide, why vocabulary is important. Oh, hang on. Ollie, do you want to talk to that one? Yes, sure. So thank you. This is what you said. We asked you uh, what makes the biggest difference in terms of uh, communicative ability in the productive skills. You felt broadly just over, uh, just the most of you, uh, just by a small number, felt that grammar was the most important thing, followed by good memorization of a range of um, kind of uh, chunks of language and a similar number saying wide vocabulary. So quite an even split there in your experience and views. On receptive skills, you were more coherent, uh, you felt, or not coherent, more homogenous, you felt the vocabulary generally was the most important thing for ability in receptive skills. Jim. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. What I put up here are a couple of quotations from um, the Teaching Schools Council's MFL Pedagogy Review to try and characterise where we stand in the business of, of teaching modern foreign languages. So it's, it's uh, what do we think language is and how does it work, but also how do we learn languages? Um, and these, these kind of help, help me characterize where I think we stand. And I know this isn't a, a popular standpoint, but I'm gonna try and persuade you that um, what I'm thinking is probably about right. So one of the things uh, the pedagogy review says, let me start with a second bit of quotation there. We use grammar the grammar of a language to say what we wish and understand what's said to us. Grammar is indispensable for communication. Um, one of the features of um, the way we handle language in the UK and try to teach it is that we have a very grammar-centered approach, um, that we really think grammar is the priority and we spend a lot of time trying to teach it. And one of the effects of doing that uh, leads you to the, the second bit, which is the first in that list, that other things like vocabulary can be uh, a bit more seen as a bit more expendable. So language courses that are organized around them thematic topics can be too specialized, teaching relatively rare words used at the expense of common words. And there's an idea that runs throughout the, the Teaching Schools Council stuff, uh, which is that you can kind of dispense with thematic and fairly infrequent words by using the most frequent words in language which will do the work for you. And I know Ollie went to a seminar fairly recently where he heard Ian Balkman come out with the idea of you can get more bang for your buck just by losing, by using these highly frequent words and you can use them to replace the less frequent words in the things you're talking about. Now, Ollie, next slide, thank you very much. So the Teaching Schools Council, um, I think probably overstates the relative importance of grammar here. Um, it's pushing the idea that topics are an unhelpful mechanism for organizing teaching. And I, I think we did hear that um, there is an idea to produce um, some kind of um, word list for GCSE, which will uh, avoid topic-based content, which is an odd way to go. Um, but there is also this idea that um, vocabulary input can be limited to small numbers of highly frequent vocabulary. You can avoid the inconvenience of teaching this thematic, less frequent stuff just by replacing it with frequent stuff, and that will do the job for you. Now, the Teaching Schools Council doesn't stand in isolation saying that. It's, it's a feature of modern foreign language in Britain since pretty much the Second World War, I think. So if you look at the um, MFL subject content description from the Department for Education, you'll find it doesn't specify vocabulary content. In fact, it mentions the word vocabulary just once. There's no specification. It's a 25 page document. 16 pages of that document are given over to a grammatical description of what should be learned. So nearly two thirds of the document is grammar and there is really no vocabulary at all in it. So you can see the kind of um, grammatical slant that the, the powers that be have here. If you look at GCSE grade criteria, you'll find they're quite specific 
in terms of the structure. There's a hierarchy of structure that learners are meant to attain. You attain those structures, then you've hit the, the level that you're walking to, you hit the marks you're working to. And Ollie's going to show you this. It's much, much less specific in terms of vocabulary. And this idea that vocabulary is something that is, is could be really avoided, not mentioned at all, it, it doesn't appear over the horizon in most people's consideration. It, it comes from uh, an idea that um, if you remember the SILT, the Center for Information on Language Research and Teaching, and uh, they used to run seminars which were actually entitled uh, The Dangers of Teaching Thematic Vocabulary. So teaching vocabulary is actually a dangerous business, like you can lose a leg if you do it. Um, and it's part of this idea that you really want to avoid it. Now, the Teaching Schools Council says that the, the idea for setting about teaching a language this way is based on research. They, they seem to quote mind a lot, which is very flattering. But if we move on to the next slide, Ollie. Um, next slide. Yeah, it's, uh, there we are. Oh, there we are, right. Now, I'm not sure that research says it. Not mine, not anyone else's. Um, and I think the last 30 years of research in vocabulary particularly tell a very different story and should set us in a very different direction. Um, but it's useful to understand why is it that the MFL in UK still thinks the way it does think, even though research is heading in a different direction. So um, historically, um, language course, so if you go back into the 19th century and earlier, historically language courses always include vocabulary and usually lots of it. And you get to a time at the end of the 19th century where um, it was thought that they could make vocabulary learning and teaching a bit more scientific. And one of the features of that is people like Otto Jesperson, Henry Sweet, Harold Palmer. Um, and one of the features of this is that um, they wanted to understand how they could control and direct the volumes of vocabulary rather better. So vocabulary was central to their ideas about how modern foreign language should be, uh, should be taught. And you get a vocabulary control movement and they, you begin to get the beginning of modern corpora being developed. So you get things like the Thorndike and Lorge list in the States. Um, but they recognize that you don't just want to teach only the most frequent vocabulary. It really doesn't allow you to make materials that you create coherent. And so what you get are the, uh, uh, the creation of things like core vocabularies, which are guided by vocabulary in their selection but include a whole lot of stuff in terms of the thematic content you want and also the, the words you need to manage a classroom. Um, there's one in French from this period from the 30s by James B. Tharp. And just to give you a number to play with, this is a basic French vocabulary and it has four and a half thousand items in it. You may want to ponder on that figure later on. But this interest in vocabulary just drops out of fashion around the Second World War. Um, and um, David Wilkins, who was um, professor of linguistics in Reading for a long time, he attributed it to the prominence of structural linguistics. And he characterizes structural linguistics as the idea that if you teach grammar, you teach the language, you teach the structure, you teach the language. And because the structure is the language, you don't really need more words than are necessary to illustrate the structures and the rest you just don't have to worry about. And this idea seems to have been so per pervasive, it, it, it extends into communicative approaches. So you find the communicative approaches um, express much the same idea. This is a picture of Chris Brumfit, who's uh, an old friend, um, sadly no longer with us. But nearly 40 years ago, he wrote a book called Communicative Methodology in Language Teaching. It's a standard kind of text. Um, and one of the interesting things that Chris does is to explain why he's not going to talk about vocabulary in this book, and he doesn't. This is the only thing he says about it. What he does is to explain that lexical choices in teaching must arise incidentally out of other morphological, syntactic, and functional criteria. You can see from the order of those things, he's putting structure first. It's still a, something you, you, you build vocabulary around your structures. Interestingly, he's put in those functional criteria. You must have words to do something. And that's an important idea. But still, vocabulary is not a priority. It's kind of incidental to the language learning process. So 
as I say, we've had, that was the idea 40 years ago, we've had 30 odd years of, of research into vocabulary and ideas have changed, I think. So David Wilkins has put out, as it's a nice pithy quote, this, without grammar, very little can be conveyed, without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. And Wilkins was very keen to raise vocabulary up the sort of scale of priorities in teaching a language. Um, Michael Long and Jack Richards um, produced an introduction to a book of mine a few years back, and they said, well, vocabulary can be viewed as the core component of all the language skills. And what they mean by that, I think, is not just that it's an important, a very important part of the language, but they're getting at an idea that the, the words that you know, the number of words that you know, actually drives the learning of a language and all the other things. So if you want to be good at grammar, you've got to grow a big vocabulary because the big vocabulary grows, it, it drives the acquisition of other things like, like grammar. Stephen Krashen, who's still a big name in language learning, points out that learners have always known this. Um, language learners always carry dictionaries with them when they go abroad, they don't carry grammar books. And they regularly report that um, lack of vocabulary is a major problem for them. Um, now, I think modern foreign language in the UK still tries to be structuralist, and you can see that in the DFE descriptors, you can see it in the, the marking guidelines from the exam boards, and you can see it in the, the ideas of the Teaching Schools Council's report. It's not keen on research, and actually it's getting to the stage where it's not just ignoring vocabulary, it's actually opposing teaching a lot of vocabulary because it thinks it's dangerous that actually it's going to get in the way of the real business of learning a language. So. Uh, yes, I just thought I'd, uh, uh, I'd illustrate that with some of the examples of the mark schemes that uh, we all work with. So this is the AQA GCSE mark scheme. And I've highlighted in yellow there, the references to grammar and structures. And in fairness to those mark schemes, and this one's a good example, it does refer to vocabulary. So uh, the, the top box there is the 16 marker in the uh, AQA GCSE, a variety of vocabulary is used. What's interesting, though, is that a variety is how do you measure that? What con constitutes a variety? Who knows? And I think we all probably feel that marking in that way is quite uh, subjective. The three time frames, though, and the number of errors are very easily countable. So I think what happens as a, as a teaching practitioner is that then that starts to influence our thinking and dominate our thinking in terms of how we judge the quality of a student's writing. It's the same in the in the more complex essay. So it, lots and lots of references to the variety of linguistic structures. Um, a kind of obsession with time frame, really, um, across uh, the, the rest of the exam, both in the speaking and in the writing. This is the CIE uh, uh, IGCSE. Um, this is the range uh, um, uh, rubric, extended, well-linked uh, sentences, simple and complex structures. Of course, uh, until this year, we had uh, the other linguistic features, which was really a kind of a roller coaster through as many pieces of grammar as your students could possibly demonstrate in their 120-word essay about uh, what they did last weekend, Pearson and Excel, very similar flavor. All the exam boards encourage us to count um, the, uh, the number of grammatical variations um, that students can demonstrate, whereas there are references to vocabulary, they're much less um, countable and much more subjective. Right, what we want to move on to next is to have a look at just how many words, how much vocabulary do you need to begin to attain some of the the levels that are expected of GCSE, and we're presuming that everyone agrees GCSE is pitched at A2, B1 level. Um, but to do that, we've got to agree what we're talking about when we mean vocabulary and, and what we mean when we're talking about knowing vocabulary. So I'm going to pass over this very quickly because I think probably intuitively you will know all of this, but um, vocabulary may well be all about words, and by word we mean a lemma. So when learners try and learn a word, what they have in mind and what they will store in the mental lexicon is a base word. And they expect that that base word is going to be inflected. It's going to have various regular inflections for plurals, past tenses, and so on. Um, other morphological derivations are probably going to be treated as different words, separate words. Um, and knowing that word, um, can get quite complicated once you start delving into uh, inflections in, in French and other languages, that can be quite a lot. Um, but it also means not just knowing the form of the word, the sound and the, the, write, the written form, the spelling, 
Uh, it's also understanding the meaning and the associations and the connotations that go with the word. They can vary from language to language. And it's also knowledge of, of use. There are words that uh, for commonly go together and others that never go together. And there are some words that you, uh, you can't use in polite company, things like swear words. Now, that's an awful lot of knowing, but fortunately, a vocabulary size metric is probably uh, a good shorthand to getting all of that. So um, an estimation of how many words a person can recognize and maybe link to meaning is probably going to tell you a lot about all the other aspects of vocabulary knowledge. If you don't have a big vocabulary, you can't be fluent. But if you do, probably you will be quite fluent. So we're talking about lemmas and we're talking about how many words you can recognize and attach a meaning to. Next slide, Ollie. Now, what we're going to do here is to try and give you an idea, a flavor of just how many words you need to hit comprehension, because it's, it's very easy not to know and not to appreciate just kind of what you're dealing with. Um, what I've done here is to take a, a piece from uh, a short paragraph there taken from the BBC News over the summer. And I've redacted every word that is outside the most frequent 100 words in English. So you're put in the position of being one of your learners starting out knowing almost no words in English. Um, and those X's stand for something. And those 100 words actually appear to give you a lot of coverage. In this case, it's about 32% of coverage. But what you'll appreciate is that 32% of coverage needn't tell you anything at all. So if I were to ask you what that piece is about, um, I, I would confidently think no one could tell me. You just can't tell. If you increase the coverage, so this is about 50% coverage. Usually in most European languages, that's about a thousand words. A thousand words is going to give you about 50% coverage. And actually a thousand words seems like a lot of words and 50% coverage seems like a lot of coverage, but it doesn't help a lot. Um, unless you really know what this is about, it's hard to put anything in. It's very hard to fill in the gaps because there are just too many gaps there. If we move on, I move on to my anecdote. Um, I had a conversation, a telephone call years ago now from Alex Kirby, who worked for the BBC, who wanted to write an article about a parrot, an African gay with 900, African grey, with 950 words. And he had the idea because he thought 100 words are needed for half of all reading in English. He had the idea that a parrot with 950 words was going to be pretty linguistic and you could, it could handle a wide range of material. And he wanted me to confirm that. And of course, I couldn't. He was wrong. And he was wrong because it's a parrot. Of course, he didn't really understand as we would any of those words. But the point, there's a point too that 50% coverage doesn't give you 50% understanding. 50% coverage may give you nothing at all. And in fact, a lot more coverage may also give you very, very little. If we move on to the next slide, this is actually about 2,000 words. Normally, 2,000 words in um, Western European languages like French, English, Spanish will give you about 50%, uh, give you about 80% coverage, which seems like a, a lot. But uh, in, this, in this particular example, it's, it's a bit less. Um, but you'll get the idea, there it is, I've, that is 80%, just over 80% coverage. And what I've done is to put in the names in there. Um, but you'll see even with more than 80% coverage, you've still got gaps. So Australia has something, it's something, something, and these unknown bits kind of cluster together. Um, if you're reading, you've got the opportunity to kind of go back, take your time, have a think about what might fill the gap. If, but if you're listening, having um, three words in close proximity that you don't know can throw you seriously off comprehension. Reading, uh, sorry, listening is, it's a kind of ephemeral. Uh, it's very quick, you're under time pressure to understand the stuff. Once you lose track, you've lost track of what's going on and it's very hard to pick it up. But 80% coverage doesn't give you very, very much understanding necessarily. To get to something like full understanding, you have to get to something like full coverage. And the figure usually given is 95% or better. This is coverage provided by 
the most frequent 5,000 words in English, and actually it's 99% coverage. Once you've got full coverage, 5,000 words or better, then you're getting to the stage where you understand pretty much all the words and you can take pretty much all the meaning. Next slide. So this is given, this is Paul Nation who does this kind of coverage work and, and we all uh, copy it and, and it, it holds good. It's a good way of looking at how many words you need for comprehension and how many words you need for communication. But Paul interprets this kind of information as giving two thresholds. And there's an 80% coverage threshold, and that's usually at about 2,000 words. And once you cross this 80% um, threshold, you begin to get the beginnings of just understanding. There's enough words for there for you to sort of have moments of lucid lucidity and things you're reading or things you're listening to. It's, it's the beginning of independent communication. Remember the, um, the B1 classification in the CEFR is called independent communication. So that name is not coincidental. It's there to fit with that kind of figure. Um, with, there's a second threshold, which Paul calls a probabilistic threshold at about 5,000 words to give you pretty much complete comprehension of a text. Pretty much complete coverage will give you, or stands a chance of giving you pretty much complete comprehension. 95% probably won't do it. And the figure that Paul Nation, Batia Lavra and others use is more like 80, 98 or 99%. Where these figures will, Paul has worked in English, but these figures work for French and I can show you why. If we move on to the next slide. Coming soon, it's very exciting. There we are. Ah, this is just a quick oh, um, right. com comparison to uh, what you said in your uh, in your pre webinar <coughs> question. There, I think it's uh, I think it's fair to say that as practitioners, we probably generally underestimate um, uh, the number of words our students need. Granted, the question was worded slightly differently. It was really for uh, what you felt would be needed at a good pass at GCSE or indeed at A level. And if we say that GCSE is roughly A two to B one, and, and A level is aimed probably at B two. I think it, I think practitioners probably do underestimate uh, the, those vocabulary totals in comparison to the Paul Nation uh, figures that you gave there, Jim. I think the thing to, to point out there is that if that's what we're thinking will get you to be one, then we should be thinking again, because you really can't do the things that the B1 descriptors describe, like um, listening to the radio and a foreign affairs program and taking something from it. You can't do that with 500 words. Maybe you can pass GCSE, we'll look later on, but you can't do it with 500 words. So um, those numbers are, I think, problematic, but those numbers that the 2000 words minimum for the beginnings of independent communication, it'll work in French. I've plotted, um, this is a, what's called a zip curve in the trade. And what it is, is the coverage you get uh, with words in descending frequency order. And I plotted a, um, a corpus by John Carroll and others for English and the Baudo corpus, which is one I use for testing uh, in French. And you'll see they're almost identical up to a thousand words. It looks a bit there like Baudo will give uh, more coverage, like French will give more coverage. So you can do more with slightly fewer words. That's I think the nature of the corpus itself, which is slightly small and has um, quite large um, it's made up of quite large portions, so you don't get the variety of plexus that you would in a bigger corpus with much more variety. So if you look at the next one, which is the uh, Routledge corpus, it's the Lonsdale, it's the, what gives rise to the Lonsdale and Le Bras um, frequency dictionary of French. And you'll see in that one um, that you get less coverage from French than you do from English, although they are almost identical at the start. Um, so these, this, this idea that 2000 words is what you need for really even the most basic of independent communication holds good for French. What have we got next? This leads to, I think, three conclusions. One of which is that the relationship between vocabulary size and comprehension is not straight line. It's kinked. Um, and if you look at the, um, the bottom there, what I've done is to sort of um, record how many words a learner might know, and then on the uh, y-axis on the left-hand side, how good their communication is going to be. 
And what you'll see is that it looks like that you, you spend a long time learning words and an awful lot of them up to about 2000 and getting almost nowhere with communication. It is very difficult to communicate unless your interlocutor is helping you a lot in really rather artificial circumstances with less than 2000 words. And we base this on the way students uh, report to us how they feel uh, they are in command of their language. Once you get past 2000 words, then your capacity to function and communicate independently does begin to take off. Sorry, were you, were you going to say something there, Ali? Yeah, just that um, from a practitioner point of view, this is, uh, I think this makes a lot of sense because uh, we're generally working with students in key stage three and four, so year seven to 11 in the <coughs> zero to 2000 space. And so what we really need to do is keep them motivated during that time in which they feel like they're not making a huge amount of progress because they feel like they still can't potentially say anything or communicate in a uh, kind of real uh, quote unquote way. Um, and that therefore kind of as soon as we can get them through those 2000 words to start uh, uh, ramping up that curve, uh, the better, I suppose. Yeah, I think the uh, it's something for teachers and for teachers to tell learners is that that experience of feeling you're not getting anywhere is normal. And this yeah, is why. Absolutely. Uh, let's go conclusion two. Conclusion two is that you need a sizable vocabulary even to begin to communicate meaningfully in a foreign language and be independent. So 2000 words at least. B1 can't begin before that level. And C level would require something over 5000. So there's an awful lot of words and there's no shortcut to this. Um, if you want to cope with the variety of language input that is real language, you have to, you know, you have to have this number of words. No amount of other knowledge, like grammatical knowledge, is going to make up for that shortcoming if you haven't got it. It's quite um, quite common to hear among uh, language teachers uh, in language teaching circles these days, uh, Jim, that we can become more fluent by learning sort of set chunks and set phrases and having those at our disposal. Um, essentially all the time. Is that not a shortcut in some way or do you not buy into that? Well, that's only if the person you're talking to or, or the person who is speaking you're listening to is using those set chunks and phrases. But in real language, they don't. Um, and so I can see why you would use that as a strategy if you've only got 500 words to handle something like a GCSE oral exam. But as a strategy for real communication, no, it won't work. Um, if you want to use it as a technique to aid the process of teaching, we'll come back to rote learning, I think, probably towards the end of the presentation. Yeah. Um, but um, it's, it's a route to learning, but it is not a route to communication. The world does not work in a very small number of preset phrases. Conclusion three. Um, it's very important to understand that vocabulary size and overall language ability correlate. The bigger your vocabulary, then the better you can read and understand speech and the better you can speak and write. It, it's not a perfect correlation. I've just explained that you know, the, the relationship is not perfectly linear, so you won't get it. It's curved at best. But um, and there's more to communication than just words. So you do need grammar. You, know, you do need um, contextual knowledge. You need all sorts of things, really. And for a perfect for a, a perfect correlation, you've got to have a perfect test, both of vocabulary and language ability, and we don't have those things. But it's much stronger than you'd think. So if we put up the next slide, this is um, this is a scattergram of people entering, this is quite an old thing, 20 years ago, people entering our pre-sessional courses in Swansea where we could test their vocabulary size up to 10,000 words. And we had a, um, an IELTS reading comprehension test, which was at the same time as their vocabulary test. And you'll see just how close that is. Um, if I put in a, a line of best fit, you'd have seen that it's flatter between zero and 2000, and then it goes up. So it is curved, but really that's, that's a pretty good fit around that, uh, that um, common uh, line of best fit. And the, the correlation is 0.78, which is good. Um, and that leads to, something else and uh, I've quoted from Lars Steer here um, because he gets very similar figures to the ones I just presented you with across the skills the listing looks a little low there but uh, he does point out that if you use um, an oral vocab test along with your to compare with your listing correlation you do get a higher correlation and, and in fact you do but what he points out is that with correlations of that size 
vocabulary can explain over 50% of variance in reading comprehension scores, just vocabulary explaining more than half of the difference in scores that, that your, your pupils will get. So vocabulary size isn't just an important factor in reading comprehension performance and, and the other skills, it's the most important factor, more important than, than, than grammar, more important than anything else anyone else has kind of come up with. Um, you wanted to talk to that one, Ollie. Yes, I just found this, uh, this is uh, from one of your uh, earlier studies, uh, Jim, but I thought it was a really um, uh, easy to understand graph to show students, and I have actually been showing it to some of my students, that um, it, it partly to motivate them to, 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 to stick with their vocabulary. It's not the most uh, gratifying of tasks sometimes, I totally understand that from a student's point of view, but I find that graph really powerful. Um, students getting a uh, high grade at A level tend to have significantly larger vocabularies uh, than those getting uh, B, C's and D's. And I think that's a, um, a fairly compelling image, uh, quite a motivating one uh, for, for working with students of secondary and uh, kind of post-16 age. Yeah, that high vocabulary is very predictive of an A grade at A level, but and also at, at uh, actually less so at GCSE, but it, it does work for GCSE too. Ollie, I think you're up next. Yes. Um, so, um, firstly, um, the, so there are the, I suppose the context of this is there is some emerging uh, proposals uh, for um, a new GCSE in modern languages. They're not confirmed yet, but they are emerging nevertheless, and there is a certain amount of information in the public domain. Um, and that, as Jim uh, was alluding to, we won't be using uh, topics to sort of guide our curriculum development. Um, rather, we'll be using uh, a list of grammar structures and a word list, uh, which will be largely, uh, very extensively determined by uh, word frequency, which sounds kind of on its uh, kind of sensible uh, when you say it like that. Um, and what that would mean um, would that we'd be essentially teaching uh, students a vocabulary like this, essentially lots and lots of words in the most uh, frequent word band, so 1,000 perhaps uh, in the in the 2,000 frequent frequency band as well, and very little else because of this logic that it's better to teach uh, students words uh, in the highest frequency because you get more bang for your buck, um, and that teaching any word that we teach in the in the lower frequency bands of 3,000 plus is at the expense of something which could have been more useful. Now that sounds kind of compelling um, at first sight, uh, but um, the data that, um, that Jim, that you found in your research, correct me if I'm wrong, is that when students learn a language successfully um, and when researchers then go and find out what those successful learners' vocabularies look like, it tends not to be like this with a kind of heavy clustering of words uh, almost exclusively limited to the top frequency bands, it's a much more natural and distributed spread. So yes, of course, we're, we're, learners tend to know more words in the top bands because those <laughs> words occur more often, therefore they have encountered them more, therefore they're more likely to know them. But they're also learning lots and lots of material from the lower frequency bands. Uh, this is a kind of uh, theoretical uh, projection of that, uh, but here you can see this is uh, from a study of Japanese learners of English. And you can see there that, uh, I mean, by the sheer size of their vocabulary, this is 4,500 or so doing some quick maths. Um, actually, they still don't quite have 100% coverage of the most frequent words, but they've got pretty good coverage of those two uh, top frequency bands, but they've got all sorts of additional words as well, because when they're learning English, they're learning English, which is not just generic high frequency English, they're learning to, uh, to say to say things and communicate about things in English. And as soon as we start communicating about things, um, we inevitably start to need and start to use and start to encounter in speech and writing the less frequent, what's called content vocabulary in this 3000 plus, um, uh, in these 3000 plus brackets. Uh, is that, have I explained that correctly, Jim? I want no, to no, I, sure. that's exactly right. I would, I would state further, I have never encountered a learner who learns in frequency order. Learners, if they're going to, it's because it's the way, this is what, that, that graph there is a, a very good one in the sense that that's what real language looks like. And if you don't have a lexicon that looks a bit like that, you haven't got a language. So it, that's what we've got to be teaching and that's what we want our learners to learn. Go I ahead. think there's, there's a further point that if, yeah. if, if we restrict our teaching to these top two bands, there's a actually that's quite an unnatural way to speak because our our, our, <laughs> our brains will naturally take us into the less frequent bands and it's quite a it's quite an exercise it's quite a, 
it's quite cognitively demanding to be constantly substituting words for more common ones to express things which actually are quite specific and therefore naturally exist in the later frequency bands. Uh, so normal, pro do you want to talk this one? Shall I talk through this one? I, I can talk through this one. Yeah. I, there's, there's a reason it looks that way, which, which Ollie has pointed out. Um, you, you actually need more than just the most frequent words. The, it, it's helpful to think of it this way. It's a bit of an overgeneralization, but it's a, a useful one to think of. The higher frequency words tend to include structure and function words. They're often polysimous. Um, so they've got multiple meanings with multiple kind of functions. And these are, are, are certainly vital for communication, but what they allow us to do really is to structure, provide structure to the other things that we also need, which is those lower frequency words, words from the 3000 words frequency band and beyond. And these are often called content or lexical words, and they tend to uh, comprise the topic or subject related words that you need to actually talk about something. Communication is always about something, you need the right words to talk about that something. So you have to think of this frequent and highly frequent and less frequent vocabulary as complementary. You need both sets if you actually want to communicate and you can't pick and choose and work with a limited set except in the most artificial uh, and contrived circumstances. Um, so you really don't want a, a syllabus that has no topical contents at all because it won't have that content vocabulary. Ollie, do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so this is uh, drawing data from two similar studies which took um, uh, French learners in Greece at B1 level and French learners in the UK at B uh, B1 level, so roughly GCSE level, higher tier, <coughs> and looked at their um, the vocabulary. So what you can immediately see is, uh, firstly, the UK students seem to know quite a lot less than their Greek students of French uh, at a similar age, and uh, that they, uh, that they um, knew a lot less actually in every single word band. So that's not only that UK learners are learning fewer high frequency words actually traditionally until now, but also fewer low frequency ones as well. And we'll see some uh, numbers to compare that um, on the next slide. Now, the, the emerging proposals would suggest that a better, more successful vocabulary would look something like this. So good coverage of the first two bands and then nothing at all which again looks like an improvement compared to the orange line, uh, which is the UK today. The problem is though that students are unlikely to learn, well, almost definitely won't learn everything that they encounter. So what the risk is, that is they start to have a vocabulary which looks like this and that their vocabulary, both input and uptake becomes impoverished as a result. Here are those uh, figures and you can see this uh, uh, co compares French in the UK with Greece and in Spain at different levels of the common European framework, A1, A2, uh, and GCSE sits really at this threshold between A2 and B1, B2 towards A level, C1, C2 proficiency. Um, and you can see uh, for B1 in Greece, 2,400 odd words, 2,200 in Spain. In the UK, really, we have far lower um, uh, uptake of vocabulary uh, among learners both at B1 and to a certain extent at B2, although by B2 A level we do seem to be catching up. So it, it, it is true that French and the, uh, modern language learning in uh, in Britain, even when we're talking about languages other than English, and it's, it's I think it's misleading to compare the learning of English uh, in, uh, in European countries with the learning of French or German or Spanish in the UK, but even when we're comparing with the learning of French in other European jurisdictions, the UK lags behind. Can I just say a, a word on that? The, in the, one of the left-hand columns labeled word list size. Um, there, there is an idea that the CFR doesn't have vocabulary size measures. And to a certain extent it doesn't, but actually they do have word lists. So there are waste age and threshold level word lists in French and English and a variety of other languages. They are core word lists. They're not complete word lists, but A2 is pitched at a thousand words. B1 is pitched at 2,000 words. So they fit in pretty well with what learners are actually acquiring in Greece and Spain, but it's a long way away from what we have in the UK, even though our English word list at threshold level is 2,000 words. Sorry, carry, carry on. Uh, so the final part of this presentation before we move to the discussion really is, uh, well, why is that? Um, why do British students seem to know not so much as their, as their counterparts on the continent? And what can we do about it? And I suppose, um, at first up, there are all sorts of reasons. We know as practitioners, there are all sorts of reasons why teaching languages in the UK is hard. We don't seem to have enough hours and the number of hours that we have in the timetable by all accounts seems to be going down. That's confirmed in 
the collective memory, but it's also confirmed in things like the language trends reports um, periodically. Uh, we know that there's a motivational challenge because of global English uh, and because of the ubiquity of English in, uh, in online lives. It, it's difficult uh, sometimes to convince uh, students that learning a language is a, a worthwhile investment at the age 11, 12, 13. And we have, as we've seen, these exams which fetishize and reward tenses and complex structures more so and more objectively than they uh, reward um, a rich and varied vocabulary. Um, we have this slightly awkward, I think, conflation of vocab and grammar or lexical and syntactical range in the mark scheme such that you can have a script, and I think we've all seen them, that uh, is pretty boring to read and where the vocab is pretty awkward and, and actually sometimes doesn't even really make sense, uh, logically speaking, but where the grammar's all good and technically they answer the question, so it counts as an excellent script, even though we know heart of hearts, that's not really what language is about. And we also kind of suspend our disbelief uh, when um, we, uh, in, the, in the kind of GCSE phase, because um, we know we're, that we're trying to work towards automaticity and fluency. It's very fashionable uh, to say that. And we all like, I think, you know, I'm saying this about myself. We like, to, we like to believe this is true about our learners. But actually what I've learned here is that that's just not really the case. If my students have got a thousand words, they're not actually fluent and automatic. They're just probably good at speaking in quite rehearsed and quite contrived uh, contexts. So this is what you, your thoughts were on how competent you think your students are. And I did ask a pretty general question here. So uh, thank you for, uh, for indulging me with it. And generally you felt that um, th students don't know many words apart from uh, the very quite narrow um, topics that GCSE gives you uh, or, or that they do know some words, but not really the ones they might want or need. So I found that interesting that there was a consensus among those that did that questionnaire that there seems to be a bit of a mismatch in the vocabulary that we're teaching and the vocabulary that students uh, want to learn. Um, it's just worth pausing here upon um, what the difference is between input and uptake and, and what um, uh, how many words we can perhaps expect uh, teenagers to learn. I don't think there's anything biologically different or socially different from UK teenagers that means they aren't in theory capable of the similar kinds of uptake, uptake as their, their count, uh, continental counterparts, particularly when <coughs> we're comparing them with uh, learners of French or other languages. In a good EFL course, so English as a Foreign Language course, uh, there's evidence um, of uh, students of secondary age learning about five words per hour, let's say per lesson, um, and that's usually at a 50% rate. Uh, so 50% 50 of all the words that they learn or that they see in lessons, uh, they learn. In um, uh, languages other than English courses, there's evidence that that can be about four words per hour. But in the UK, we've, the evidence that we've seen varies and actually can be less than even one word per contact hour or in some ways, uh, in some cases, up to four words per hour. But by all accounts, less than what is happening in successful courses um, overseas. There's an example, example of this comparing um, uh, British learners with that, I think the same cohort of Greek learners. And you can see, you can see that actually year, year one of language learning, so year seven, not totally incomparable. And it's really years eight, nine, and 10, uh, those uh, key stage three, key stage four years that really we seem to be decelerating and losing ground. Actually in um, the upper stage of key stage four and uh, key stage five, there's respectable um, uptake of vocabulary happening. I think this has implications, actually, uh, quite exciting implications for uh, our negotiations with our schools and our governors about curriculum time uh, uh, and hours per week, because if we have um, target vocabulary sizes that are associated with notions of fluency or indeed uh, public exams, then it's quite easy to, to calculate literally mathematically how much curriculum time we probably really need if we're looking at four to five uh, words per hour. Uh, my slides occasionally stick. Here we are. Uh, this is what your uh, views on um, uptake should be. And this is, a, I guess, a mean question because this is not something we learn in our PGCE, how many of the words that students meet in our lessons should they learn. I think uh, what's it's fair to say is that as practitioners, we probably tend to overestimate what is realistic. Um, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, that the best courses, um, in the best courses, uptake appears to be up to, but generally not beyond, 50% of um, the words that are encountered, the words that are input. Is that right? Yeah, on, that's the average for a whole cohort. So the good learners will learn a lot more, maybe 80%. Bad learners are going to really struggle at all. But in a, a really successful course, on average, uptake is about 50%. And it's it's quite common. It's quite, uh, that, that's kind of what happens in a good course. So by, by, uh, yeah. by consequence, if we have a target vocabulary size, uh, realistically, we probably need to input double the amount of words 
yeah. uh, compared to what their target is, which Correct. is a really, a really interesting metric. Uh, we asked you also what your views on our on textbooks, because that's what we're going to just talk about briefly before we finish. And uh, you generally were pretty supportive of the uh, thematic content uh, provided in textbooks, and you're pretty confident about the, the progress that's uh, made in Key Stage 3. And of course, I didn't define in that question uh, what we meant by progress, so perhaps we might be referring to different things. Uh, there is some evidence that measures vocabulary size in UK schools um, a, a cohort level as, as uh, students progress through the year groups. And what's quite interesting uh, in this orange bars versus in the 2006 study um, is that there's a pretty decent uptake in year seven. There is some uptake in year eight, but year eight to year nine really stalls. And there isn't a particularly big increase in year 10 either. And year 11 is where it starts to take off again. Interesting in year 11, that's when we start generally teaching different types of topics probably for the first time, whereas year eight, year nine, we're teaching the same sorts of things, holidays, hobbies, free time, as we already encounter in year seven, but generally in different tenses. Um, there is a study uh, that uh, uh, Jim and I have been working on, uh, looking at a different school. It's probably a less academically um, a successful school. Uh, well, less not successful, but has lower academic overall attainment, in, for example, in terms of attainment eight rather than progress eight. Um, and uh, although the overall numbers are lower, it's also because it was done at a different time of the school year. But the interesting thing about that, if I go to the next slide, was that the same deceleration in progress was happening in exactly the same years, uh, essentially year nine. Year nine seems to be a point in which MFL teaching and progress uh, or uptake of vocabulary really seems to slow down. Perhaps textbooks are part of the problem. And here I draw on a study uh, from a few years ago uh, of Encore Tricolore by a lady called um, uh, Claudia Chicholt. And uh, a more recent study that uh, Jim and I have done of the studio textbook series that you may well know. Um, it was found looking at Tricolor that the number of topic areas is uh, very limited and that the course book, the content of each book is essentially very similar. So students cycle through the same sorts of topics uh, pretty much every year for five years. And we found that in studio as well, and we quantified it. And more than three quarters of content relates to just six topics, leisure, holidays, home, relations, school, and jobs. One in four lessons is on free time and one in five lessons on holidays. That's an incredible amount of repetition. And the same sorts of, if we teach the same topics, it's fair to say that the same sorts of words are gonna come up again and again. The number of words input in year 10 in Uncle Trickle was 1,482 in the glossary the summative list for studio show a quite significant decrease of a thousand to down to a thousand and six words. And I'm sitting here on my desk with an old copy of Trickle Law 4. It's much bigger and thicker than the studio uh, um, GCSE textbook is. In fact, that's just for uh, that's for two years, whereas the Encore Trickle Law 4 book is just for one year. So we seem to be uh, teaching less. Now, I know that's also a consequence of uh, reduced curriculum time. The nature of that input, uh, it was found uh, in the study of trickle law that there is an absent, absence of content words and a high degree of repetition and recycling. Uh, the same is true of studio, only 1,750 different words are introduced in studio. So essentially, if you learn all the vocab lists in studio, even if you learned all the lemmas in those lists, you can't actually get to 2,000 words at all. Um, so that I found that quite arresting as a statistic, if 2,000 is indeed the level at which we start to become uh, approach independence of use. I think there's a sort of rule of thumb here. If we only teach X words, then students will only ever learn a maximum of a subset of these words, i.e. a proportion of those words. And for many learners, it will legitimately be significantly fewer. Um, students won't learn more words than we give them, uh, generally speaking. Uh, this is a closer look at uh, the input uh, per hour of teaching in the studio series. And actually you can see, you can start to see uh, why vocabulary uptake perhaps seems to decelerate in year eight, year nine. And it's because actually the textbooks, and I think the same was found to be true of, of trickle or input per hour, the number of new words that the textbooks introduce just massively slows down in year eight, year nine. Arguably, it's because something else is going on. Perhaps we're uh, investing in grammar and tenses during those years instead, but it is at the cost of vocabulary. And perhaps we've, uh, I haven't quite before now understood just how important vocabulary is, though, in relative terms to driving competence and fluency in language. So I found that quite interesting. Can I add something there, which yeah, is please. that if uh, you've got learners at a very low level and they're not increasing their vocabulary for two years, they're not making progress. And if French and other languages are losing their popularity in that period, uh, the inability to see progress may be part of a whole thing. So this uh, inability to input vocabulary significantly in those years 
is probably a major, major problem. I'm going to uh, rattle through the end because I want to give some time to uh, for Q&A. Um, but if I can move on, that's, the, by the way, the a, a kind of um, uh, consensus what ideal input would look like. So you can see a British a standard British textbook seems to vastly undershoot what uh, an ideal level of input would be. 11 words per hour would give you more or less the five words per hour that good courses seem to achieve at a cohort level. Now, Teaching uh, languages in England is like gardening a in a gale, that's uh, Eric Hawkins. It's hard because students come into French and then they go off and they've got 30 lessons in other subjects and they don't come back to you until later in the week. And of course, they'll have forgotten all sorts of things. So it's hard teaching uh, languages. Uh, but what can we do? Yes, there are lots of things that are outside of our control. Um, government policy, exam boards, exam content, global English, Brexit, all these things. Some things which we have some influence on, attitudes to languages, perhaps we can shape the textbook choice, so there's a limited market, but we can choose the best one. But there are things within our influence, which I think um, as a, as a, you know, I'm reflecting as a, a re reflecting, sorry, as a practitioner, that we can do to really drive vocabulary uptake. The materials we're using class, the thematic and lexical variety we have in our curriculums and resisting the temptation to teach uh, hobbies and free time every year and holidays every year. The kind of teacher talk that we use inside and outside the classroom, vocabulary size testing as a motivational tool and informal learning opportunities um, uh, are, are, have been found to and can uh, really drive vocabulary uptake ahead of what the timetable um, allows us to do. This is an example, by the way, of a vocabulary uh, size test and we can send you this. It's really quick to do in lessons. Students essentially tick the words that they know. Uh, and you tot up the number of ticks and that gives you an overall vocabulary size score. Each column represents um, uh, a frequency band and they lose points if they tick the columns in the, the words in the sixth column because they are, uh, they are red herrings, they are fake words. So this, um, uh, this allows you to adjust uh, for overconfidence essentially. It's pretty motivating um, for students to see what their, uh, how many words it's estimated they know and they can actually measure themselves as they progress uh, through the years of a course at school. Uh, informal learning. Uh, now, Jim has got evidence, uh, and I'm sure he'll be able to answer questions about this in the Q&A afterwards, but there is evidence that learning materials uh, from outside the classroom, that, that they can have a great impact and that they work. Um, now, what is informal learning? I guess when we, could, we went in confinement, it would have been trips and exchanges, notices, signs, announcements, adverts, eavesdropping, that kind of thing. But also there's lots of things we can do in the media, in songs, films, TV series, books, TV and radio, much of which has never been so available and so easily available as it is now. Um, students who uh, encounter this material, even if they don't encounter a lot of it, will learn new vocabulary all the time. Are they, are they motivated to do this? Why hasn't this happened already? Well, I think if we combine this with, with vocab size uh, testing over a period of years, to show students that when they watch a film or watch uh, Lupin on Netflix, that it does actually influence their vocab, it might be quite motivating. And even small gains are worth it and all informal learning is indeed additional learning. I think it's quite common among English teachers to sort of uh, expect and um, uh, of their students and to encourage them to read widely outside the classroom, uh, particularly actually probably in primary years in key stage three. And I think that's possibly something we as practitioners in uh, in modern languages should see as part of the normal business of being a language teacher, investing in the informal learning that students can do outside of our classrooms. There is, of course, uh, no shortage of good content uh, with things like Netflix and Walter Presents uh, from Channel 4. Um, Jim, I want to uh, ask this question to you, really, because this is something that I come across uh, as a linguist, as a practitioner all the time. Uh, we need to keep repeating the same words between six and 20 times so that students uh, learn those words. It's all very well me harping on about um, uh, you know, in needing to increase the number of words that students learn, but surely we, don't, surely we need to teach these topics again and again, otherwise they just won't learn them. They just won't learn the words within them. Can you try and square that circle for us? Well, in I think the idea that you need to repeat every single word 20 times for it to be learned is, is probably not helpful. Um, there are some things like that's highly frequent vocabulary, which because it's highly frequent is going to get repeated so long as you're putting language in front of learners and that will do, there it is. And that's going to do a lot of the job for you. There are some words um, which often if they're um, cognate words, you just need to encounter once. Um, if you if you roll up in Mongolia and need to take a taxi, you'll probably discard. I don't know about Mongolian, but I think the word for taxi is probably taxi. You only need to encounter it once; it's there. Um, for the other stuff, I, I'm saying I, I've not seen it in the um, French stuff, but the the English language text, English EFL teaching books, as I'm familiar with, 
always come with workbooks and stuff that you send the students away to practice. They come with supplementary vocabulary books and stuff. So this is stuff you send the students away to practice. And if they do it, that's what provides the repetition. It's the exercises, the gap fill, the, the crosswords and stuff like that, that provides all the repetition that aids that process of, of recycling and, and re-encountering. And what they can do is also provide uh, to re-encounter and recall these words in a variety of different contexts, which will help retention. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, I've also just uh, uh, put a brief note on, on there in the penultimate slide of where we might find some of these thematically varied materials if indeed uh, textbooks do offer a, a kind of impoverished, uh, impoverished input. I think there's some really good, uh, this PDC and MFL project is led by I think University of, uh, of Reading. It's quite similar to um, the uh, TV Sac Monde resources for French. Uh, it's all sorts of thematically quite different material compared to the themes that we generally teach um, in GCSE. Linguascope also has some good uh, more kind of um, uh, spoken styles of language and the kind of words uh, and vocabulary that appear in spoken language rather than in written language that tends to be favoured in textbooks. Uh, the Goethe Institute and, and uh, Deutsche Welle Learn German has uh, great resources that are accessible, I think, to A2, B1 level learners. And Kutiotech uh, by the Alliance Francaise has uh, an awesome collection of songs and readers uh, to start students on this journey, uh, potentially, of, um, of uh, informal uh, learning. I think some conclusions, I suppose the conclusion that I've come to as, a, as, a, as an individual is that I, there's, there are whole new ways I can think about vocabulary um, and whole new ways I can excite learners in, in kind of engaging with them, um, talking about their progress on this vocabulary journey and, and starting to make that quite tangible for them. But on, uh, in terms of perspective on how to drive and measure progress, I think uh, I've learned that vocabulary is much more important than I'd realized and it can be used motivationally. Um, where am I aim for? I think I probably um, need to teach more words than I had traditionally uh, recognized. And that those words really uh, and unquestionably need to be across the frequency bands, not just to kind of uh, learn them in rank order of frequency that won't work. How to achieve it? Well, I think the data, this kind of uptake data of five words per hour in on a good day has great implications for time plating debates, uh, for the kind of topics uh, that I need to teach, the variety of those topics, the variety of types of input. Uh, implications for my practice in terms of the vocab learning behaviors that I want to develop in my students. Uh, am I, am I, uh, do I set my standards high enough in terms of the independence and autonomy that they show when, uh, when uh, acquiring vocabulary? And um, making informal learning a normal part of a language learning experience, uh, even at school. Uh, for the external environment, it would help, I think, if we had clarity of purpose on what GCSE intends to do. And, um, and clarity in terms of ways to specify vocabulary for learning, perhaps not for me, um, a list of specified words that government uh, dictates, rather um, perhaps a series of themes which a, uh, a curriculum can usefully explore, which are not the same themes each year, and which, which will ensure uh, a decent progression and decent, uh, decent progression in terms of uh, uh, vocabulary uptake. Uh, we're going to leave it there.